Our, our next speaker really honestly does not need any introduction to this group, I am sure. Although, we have an awful lot of people here who are brand new, who have never been to, to the Preterist Pilgrim Weekend before. Well, we've been doing Preterist Pilgrim Weekend for about 15 years. And William Bell has been a part of it for, I believe, 13. Is that right, William? Something like that? 14. Uh, I did the very first Preterist Pilgrim Weekend all by myself. I ain't never doing that again. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, William is a fixture at the Preterist Pilgrim Weekend. If, if you don't know William, you do not know what you are missing. He, uh, he and I have had a partnership relationship ever since the real early 80s when I discovered him, so to speak. We have traveled together. He has been my moderator in debates. I've been his moderator in debates. Uh, we've traveled to Australia together to speak. We have a weekly radio program entitled Two Guys in a Bible, which you can find at www.fulfilledradio.com. It's every Tuesday evening at 6 o'clock. We would encourage you and invite you to join us. Uh, real informal discussion between the two of us. I have always and I continue to just appreciate William's insight into Scripture. And I was just sharing with someone just the other day that William and I have the kind of Christian relationship in which we are absolutely free to ask one another any question whatsoever, to explore any subject, and to disagree with one another without ever getting out of sorts with one another. And that kind of relationship is really honestly invaluable. And I have to tell you that. I don't have an awful lot of friends in this world. Not friends like William Bell, for sure. It is always an honor and a privilege for me to invite him and to introduce him to you. His lesson today is, oh, by the way, I asked him all oh, four or five months ago what his lessons were going to be, and he said, I don't have any idea. And. Was it yesterday or the day before, William? I was talking to him on the phone. I said, oh, by the way, what are your, what are your lesson titles? I don't know. And I think it was yesterday we were talking on the phone. He says, oh, by the way, my lesson titles are <laughs> the, the hour of glory. But that's okay. That doesn't mean he hasn't been studying. That doesn't mean that he's not full of his subject. I'm personally eager to hear what he has to say. Welcome to William Bell. I wish this podium were just a little wider because it doesn't fit my Bible. My you know, as you get older, your eyesight gets bad. You have to get a big Bible with big print in it. <laughs> All right. Well, it's a delight to be here as always. It's good to see this awesome crowd. And uh, I mean, it's almost full in here. And that is fantastic. Uh, delight to have those of you who are listening on the uh, live stream. And uh, to all of the speakers, uh, we appreciate your being here. And uh, it was very interesting uh, how this lesson came about. I had done a lesson that I knew I was going to use. Uh, it just took me a while to put it down on paper, and I didn't even know what I was going to title it at that point, but I've, I've presented the information before. It was well received, and um, so I thought I'd use that one, and I had another lesson in mind that it was going to use, and um, I kept saying, I'm going to write the title down. I'm going to write the title down so I can go ahead and do the lesson. Well, by the time I got ready to do the lesson, I'd forgotten the title. <laughs> and forgotten the theme. But that turned out to be a good thing because what I'm going to present actually aligns with what I was going to in the other lesson that I was going to present. And that's how the title came about. And, uh, and I want you to understand that, you know, this lesson is still in development, uh, you know, even up to the moment that I got up here. And uh, it's not going to be the most well-organized 
But what I want you to do is to try to get the concept of what I'm saying and what I'm trying to convey to you. And I think if you get the concept of what I'm saying, it will have a profound effect on you just as it did me. Now, uh, a large part of uh, this message uh, in this first lesson, the second lesson was pretty much all of my own thinking. Um, a large part of the first lesson comes from this book called The Danielic Eschatological Hour in Johannine Literature by Stephanus Milhalios. And uh, I usually go over to Harding Graduate School um, and get books. They only allow me three, so I go over and look through the bookshelf of new books coming in, and I happen to pick this up one day. Uh, and I looked through it and I said, wow, this is great stuff. And I didn't fully read it, and I still haven't finished reading it, but I started looking at it while I was preparing, and, uh, and I just saw things jumping off the page that related to what I'm going to say. So if I don't have it perfectly documented in here, you'll know, and I wanted to give credit that the information's here. And as I was just looking through it, I thought, how do they not see <laughs> What, you know, with all the rich information that's being supplied here, and if you don't have this book, I do recommend that you get it. Now, I have a ton of slides here, but I don't have as much information on all of them as Don puts on his slides, so I'm going to get through more than at least nine of them. <laughs> all right, so let's go ahead and begin, and uh, we'll see what we can do uh, with the information. And already, you know, this is so, so small I can barely see it. All right, but our objective is to demonstrate that we are not in the last days by showing through a comparison with Matthew 16, 24 through 27 and John 12, 23 through 37, that the last days occurred in the past and were fulfilled in connection with the destruction of Jerusalem. Part one will explore the context of John 12 with a focus on the background of Danielic literature. Part Two will be an exegesis of, the, uh, of John 12 in the light of Matthew 16, 24 through 28. So I'm not going to do a lot of exegesis in this particular one. I'm just going to be introducing concepts to you uh, at this point, and we'll do the exegesis in the second uh, uh, presentation. Now, to talk about the background of the literature, uh, I was sort of introduced to really, you might say, becoming um, appreciative of some of the apocryphal and pseudepigraphal, if that's the right way to pronounce that term, literature as I started to read Margaret Barker because she has so much emphasis there and I'm saying she keeps going to this literature and I started looking at it and I found that, wow, there's some great information that I've been overlooking because, you know, I thought all that stuff was just, you know, junk mail, so to speak. And, uh, and then as a result of a debate that I had uh, with the Hebrew Israelite, there was a young man by the name of Elvin Israel who um, contact, contacted me. Having heard that debate, he watched it five times. His initial intention was to refute everything. And uh, after about the third time, he was convinced. He wrote me a long letter of testimonial. And uh, he is now uh, actually debating them almost every single day, twice a day sometimes. But at any rate, he also, you know, his, his background is, is he's an educator. And um, he really loves this literature, and so he sort of reintroduced it to me again or, or reminded me of how important it was, and so I'm trying to catch up with where he is just on this particular information. But I just wanted to say that because there's so much emphasis when we start talking about the subject of eschatology on the, what I call the church sons, but a lot of people want to call the church fathers. It's hard for me to see how they could have given birth to Paul and Peter, et cetera. Uh, as far as the gospel is concerned. But at any rate, uh, I think by, uh, and, and as you'll see, uh, ignoring some of this literature, we do ourselves a little bit of harm in terms of uh, some of the information that's available. So let's look at a little bit. All right, uh, they quote from, and I'm talking about this literature, or allude to or expand on those Hebrew or Old Greek Danielic, and I have to really get close to this to, to be able to see it. Let me just turn around, and because uh, I can read the screen better than I can read this thing. All right, so they quote or allude to or expand, and I need to stay in front of the mic, on those Hebrew or Old Greek Danielic passages that explicitly refer to the final time or hour. Daniel 8, 17, 19, 10, uh, or 19, 10, 14, 11, 6, 35, 40, and 45, and also 12, 1 through 3 and 13. 
They also specifically mention the expectation of a future time or hour in allusion to either the Hebrew or Greek text of Daniel. They are dated early enough to be prior or contemporary to John's writings up to the first century AD. And they may be interpreted in an eschatological sense. So hopefully you can just kind of see how that might be of use to us as we study these themes. All right, since um, this thing doesn't automatically change, I have to <laughs> make sure I change the screen. Now, the apocryphal books of 4th Ezra, 2nd Ezra 3 to 14, and 2nd Baruch are the only ones examined here with the date near the end of the first or the beginning of the second century. These works, although they are contemporary to John, are still Jewish or Hebraic, reflecting the theological crisis of the Jews after the destruction of the Second Temple in AD 70. Their perspective is useful to us since they reflect the Jewish Hebraic hermeneutic of the Old Testament around John's time. In addition, already in Jewish tradition, there is an anticipation of the fulfillment of the Danielic eschatological time. This end time expectation is linked to the Danielic eschatological events of judgment and resurrection. The connection between the hour in Daniel and the Danielic eschatological themes was familiar to the Jews and therefore its use by Jesus and John would not have been received as unique or extraordinary. And so this literature was already out there. It was uh, available and this is what they were talking about and they're talking about the very uh, eschatological things that uh, we're discussing. Now let's look at just a couple of comparisons. I'm not going to get very deep into this, but just kind of show you how this literature relates. All right. Now this is Daniel 12, 1. Of course, at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands, watch over the sons of your people, and there should be a time of trouble. We pretty much know that verse, and I'm not going to quote the whole thing, but take a look on the other side. At that time, and, and uh, I must have left the uh, Latin translation up there, but anyway, uh, friends shall make war on friends like enemies, and the earth and those who inhabit it shall be terrified, and the springs of the fountain shall stand still, so that for three hours they shall not flow. But at least you can kind of see uh, some uh, correlation between those two and see where they were dealing with these concepts in that literature. Then you have Daniel 12, 2 and 3 that talks about many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars uh, forever and ever. All right, Ezra 7, 29, 32, 97 and 125. My son, the Messiah shall die, that's 7, 29. The earth shall give up those who are asleep in it, 7, 32. They are to be made like the light of the stars, 7, 97, and shall shine more than the stars. Does that sound like there's at least some correlation between those? Uh, most certainly, I would say that there is. All right, then Daniel 12, 2, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Then the Most High will say to the nations that have been raised from the dead, look now and understand whom you have denied, whom you have not served, whose commandments you have despised. Look on this side and on that, here are delight and rest, and there are fire and torments. Thus he will speak to them in the day of judgment. So again, this literature helps us and gives us insights into uh, what may be going on in the New Testament. Now here's one from uh, Baruch, and uh, so I've got Ezra up there, forgot to change that title. Like I told you, this was a work in progress. And so, uh, but in Daniel 7, 9, and 10, he says, I watched till the thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated, etc. You know the text, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, I've got too much information here. All right, for behold, the days are coming and the books will be opened in which are written the sins of all those who have sinned and it will happen at that time that you shall see and many with you the long suffering of the Most High. And then uh, as we look at that literature, then we can see that if we uh, examine and survey that literature, there's a lot of information that relates to the very things that we're talking about that was in existence uh, around the time of the first century, some a little before, some just shortly thereafter, but not as long after as some of the information that's being read out of these uh, so-called church fathers. Now, when we look in John chapter 12, what we see is the hour of glorification. So let me read uh, a little bit here. Uh, as if confirming the, and, and this also is from the New International Commentary, as if confirming the lament of the Pharisees, look, the world has gone after him. 
Uh, John 12, 19. Some Greeks who had come to the Passover festival approached one of Jesus' disciples asking, Sir, we want to see Jesus. The request is passed along to Jesus, triggering his decisive announcement, the hour has come that the Son of Man might be glorified. John 12, 23. And an accompanying parable introduced by the characteristic Amen, amen formula, unless the grain of wheat dies by falling into the ground or the earth, it remains alone by itself. But if it dies, it bears a great crop, John 12, 24. The tension of the preceding section between the prospect of Jesus' death and the hope of glorification or universal kingship is maintained in the simple biological fact that life represented here by a great crop or harvest comes through death and only through death. The parable is short and simple, barely long enough to qualify as a parable, and it is not uh, widely recognized as, uh, as a parable. All right, but at least you, you sort of get an introduction to what's going on with John 12. Now, when we look at the hope of glory, the hope of glory connects the New Testament inseparably and incontrovertibly to the book of Daniel. Or I said the hope, I meant the hour, <laughs> the hour of glory. The hope of glory does too, because it's the same thing. But when you talk about the hour of glory, this hour of glory is connected uh, specifically to the book of Daniel. And you know, all of this um, uh, language that we have and all these, these uh, conversations that we're having about Daniel was fulfilled at some time in the past. Look, when you study the hour of glory, you will dismiss totally with that concept, because I can assure you, the guys who want to argue that it was fulfilled in the past are not going to say that the hour that is found in Daniel was, I mean, in, in the book Gospel of John and in other places in the New Testament was already fulfilled back in the time of the Maccabees. It just will not work. All right. Now, in the Old Covenant Greek or Old Greek uh, Testament, the book of Daniel is the only book which uses the term horror. Now, just think about that for a moment. It is the only book that uses the term horror. So, if Jesus and John and the rest of the apostles were going back to the Old Testament for their doctrine on the hour, what book do you think they would go to? Just a question. I know it's pretty hard to figure out the answer. <laughs> it is only, or rather, it is also the only book which uses the term eternal life. Now think about that. With all the references that we find in the New Testament that use eternal life, the only place where it is found in the Old Testament is in the book of Daniel. Is that not amazing? That's absolutely fantastic. It's absolutely amazing. So the phrase eternal life is central to the whole gospel. Since John reiterates the idea in John 3, 16, uh, 36, 5, 24, 6, 40, 47, and 54, cross-reference 4, 14, 6, 27, 10, 28, 12, 25, 17, 2, and 3, the exact phrase is taken from Daniel 12, 2, which is the only place in the Hebrew and Greek Bible where it can be found. And that is directly from the book that I've cited uh, in terms of um, the source. All right, so the statement, a challenge. There Daniel speaks of a literal resurrection from the dead. Now that's his statement, that's not mine. But I, I put it there so you can see how people take their assumptions you know, to the text. But he says, others unto eternal life and others unto eternal contempt. The phrase eternal life is related to the Danielic son of man in the following passages. And of course, there they are. I won't repeat them. They're on the slides and you can have them if you want. They'll cost you quite a bit, but you can have them. All right. <laughs> okay. So now let's look at uh, this idea because remember Jesus introduced this statement uh, by saying that unless a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, so in order to reach the hour of glory, death had to occur, suffering had to take place. So I've got quite a few passages, but I want you to see this theme as it goes through uh, the New Testament on suffering. And you, you know, I mean, it's just gonna pop off the page. These are verses that I know that you know, but we wanna put them out there so that you can see how I'm building on the concept of this hour of glory. 
All right, so the hour of glory is preceded by the suffering, but begins with the triumph over sin and death. Uh, let's look at some false beliefs that are out there before we get to some of those texts. The belief that glory is only a parousia uh, presence or second coming event. And, um, you know, thinking that, okay, the glory comes, the, the return of Christ comes, and that's the end of all things. No, nope, that's not the way it is viewed. That glory, as several speakers have said, even Daniel, as he just left the podium, it is forever and ever, world without end, amen, and as Dunn said last night, strongest construction in the Greek, according to G.K. Bill and according to F.F. Uh, F. Bruce, uh, he's established that from Ephesians 3 and verse 21. And then we see another false belief, and that is that the glory is temporarily disconnected from the event which occasioned it. And it is not. In other words, or, or not temporarily, but temporally. In other words, we got the death of Christ here, which was the occasion of the glory, and then you're going to take the glory and separate that from that event and push it out some thousands of years away. That doesn't work. That glory is a direct result of the death that brought it about, of the suffering that preceded it. And then the third false belief is uh, the, that the glory is different in kind or nature in the end than it was in the beginning. That's also false as well. Now, in order to receive the glory, you got to go down to get the crown. All right. <laughs> Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat, what? Falls into the ground. So it goes down, right? And dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it does what? It produces much grain. And uh, that's just the Greek text uh, below there. But notice that the word, I believe, is, is karpon, which is fruit. And uh, I think that's probably a better rendering to me, at least that's the way I translate it. Uh, but again, most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Now, let's look at some of these suffering and glory motifs that are found in the scripture. The scripture says in Luke 24, verse 25 and 26, then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophet, or in all that the prophets have spoken, Ought not the Christ to have what? To have suffered these things and to what? To enter into his glory. That's that concept of the grain of wheat falling into the ground and then rising to produce much fruit. That's what he's uh, getting at there. Acts 3 and 19. The Bible says, But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his holy prophets that the Christ would suffer, he has fulfilled. Repent, therefore. Now, there's your suffering. But notice the next verse, which talks about the presence of the Lord, which is the time of the what? Of the glory of the Lord. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And I just want to make the uh, announcement once again. If you think that this glory is separated from that hour, wait until you hear the next lesson, all right? Because we're going to pull it all together. All right, then he's, this one, and Kyle... I don't know what this is, okay? But I got inspired <laughs> when I saw it. And I just thought I'd put this up here. It just jumped off the page at me. But, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. That's down, right? He was justified in the spirit. That's up. Seen by angels. That's up. Preached among the Gentiles. That's down. Believed on in the world. That's down. Received up in the glory. That's up. Now, I don't know if I got it right, but. It looks pretty good to me. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. Kyle can fix it. <laughs> but I saw those correlations in every couple of sentences. Contrast between one thing uh, to the other. But the whole idea about that was to show you that uh, there was the suffering being manifested in the flesh, and then there was the glory that followed. All right, here's another one in 1 Thessalonians 4.14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring uh, with him those who sleep in Jesus. But look at the fact that Jesus died, all right, that's his suffering, that's his death, and then his rising into glory. Again, uh, Titus 2 and 13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, there's that suffering, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, 
zealous for good works. And so you can see the glory appearing in the other verse. They're just kind of reversed in terms of the way they're written in the text. Hebrews 2, verses 9 and 10. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. Two words that are used in John, by the way, and uh, they're also used in, in Daniel. All right, and so he says that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom all things, and bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, of glory. That's what he's saying. Again, 1 Peter. And I know this is a little bit overkill, but I want to drive the point. All right, 1 Peter 1. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand what? The sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Uh, 1 Peter uh, 1 and, let's see, I want, one, I want a different text than that. Chapter 5. The elders who are among you I exhort, who am a fellow elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that is about to be revealed. And that word apocalypto means to take the cover off of what something that was hidden. And then he says, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory. Now it's also important, I didn't have time and that would, you know, this would have been twice as long. You can go right through the New Testament and put the saints in the same position of suffering and of dying and suffering, and their suffering comes as a direct result of their dying. All you got to do is read the book of Acts. Almost immediately after they obey the gospel, what do you have? You have their persecution scattering them all over. And so they begin to start going through uh, these, these sufferings and uh, on their way to an imminent glory. All right, and then here's one from Revelation. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So there is the glory. And so the crucifixion is that which brings about this hour. It is therefore connected to the crucifixion. Therefore, they sought to take Jesus. And this is uh, these are a couple of passages from John 7, 30, and also 8 and verse 20, to see how they talked about that hour. Therefore, they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. All right, these words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him. Why? For his hour had not yet come. There was a specific time, an appointed time for all of that to take place, and of course, uh, it takes place at the time of his crucifixion. The hour in 730 and 820 is likely a reference to Jesus' hour of crucifixion which is also the time of his glorification in light of John 12, 20 through 36. So this text in John 12 is very, very important. And it has a lot of information. And see, the reason that it's such an exciting passage is because it has so much of that last day stuff in it, end of Satan stuff in it, and um, uh, judgment, all of, all of that language that everybody is saying is future language, right? And so John's explanation that this hour has not yet arrived links this hour with the references in 2-4, 4, 421, 23, 525, and uh, verse 28. Now, the hour of glory, John 12, 23. Jesus uh, spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. So now in John 12, 23, he's saying that the hour has come. This is at the very close of his life now. He's about to die. And so now he says, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. And I believe that's a text out of John chapter 17. And so John 12, 23 introduces the hour of glory. John 4 and 5 provide the substance of what would be fulfilled within that hour of glory. Let's see, did I go too many? All right. Now, let's look, look at the hour of glory. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming 
when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. But the hour is coming, and what? And now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. What we have here as a result of this hour coming is the decentralization of worship. You know, again, getting back to some of the things that, that I heard Daniel said, and I certainly appreciate uh, some of the practical applications he was making in his lesson about what's going on over there in the, uh, in the Middle East. But at any rate, the hour in John 4, 21 and verse 23 concerns the eschatological time when worship of the Father will become proper and delocalized. It may not be accidental that our passage begins in 1220 with a few Greeks that have gone up to the feast to worship. So we have these Greeks from the diaspora. Jesus' hour of glorification somehow relates to the Greeks coming to worship. It's not a casual reference. Greeks coming from the Gentile regions of the diaspora. It invokes Isaiah 42 and 2, Isaiah 49 and verse 6, and also chapter 66, verses 18 through 21. Let's look at Isaiah 42, 1, and also verse 6. He says, Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights, I put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. Again, in 49, verse 6, indeed, he says, it is too small a thing. You should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Thus says the Lord, in an acceptable time, I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the land. Now here's God says, I'm restoring the land to cause, to inherit the desolate heritages that you may say to the prisoners, go forth and to those who are in darkness, show yourselves. These are themes that are found in the Gospel of John. When he talks about the hour is coming when they would worship in a, uh, when the uh, worship would no longer be centralized, geocentric. This is also a land promise as well. And he's describing the nature of the land promise. And by the way, I'm sure you all know in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, when he cites this passage in the New Testament, he says, behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. And so uh, this uh, concept is already shown to be in uh, the progress of fulfillment, and that is a direct, re direct result of Jesus' death and the glory that followed. And yet people are looking for land, uh, as Daniel was so eloquently saying, and uh, murdering people, destroying property, causing wars, and our families and uh, you know, loved ones to lose lives as a result of all this misguided eschatology because they don't know the hour of glorification. The hour of glory. All right. Now look at this text. For not, uh, fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the, uh, to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Now Jesus quotes this, he applies it to the Gentiles in Matthew 8 and verses 11 and 12. And then uh, in Luke 13, 39, we have, you know, the very same thing. And so what we have in connection with this hour is the gathering of Israel. And so he says, they will come from the east and west and from the north and the south and sit down in the kingdom of God. All right, and so Gentiles and the hour of glory, Isaiah 66, I will set a sign among them, and those among them who escape I will send to the nations, to Tarshish and Paul and Lud who draw the bow and Tubal and Javan to the coastlands afar off who have not heard my fame nor seen my glory, and they shall declare what? They shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. And let's see, so uh, the hour at which God's worship will be delocalized, John 4, 21 and 23, 
is the hour at which God's worship will be universalized. In other words, for all and uh, around the world, not simply in one geocentric location. And John hints at this proximate reconstruction of worship by stating that the Greeks sought to see Jesus. You know, it's interesting that at the beginning of the Gospel of John, uh, they find Nathaniel and Andrew, you know, when, when uh, they call uh, these disciples, and, and one of the things that they said was, come and see. Well, there was an appeal to the Jews to come and see. But in John 12, it's an appeal to Greeks to come and see. And again, I don't think that's just uh, a, uh, a casual reference that's there. I think it directly relates to what's found in the context. And so this hour of glory uh, invites the Greeks to come and to see Jesus. Now, the eschatological hour of judgment and resurrection. Most assuredly, I say to you, I have no idea what kind of time frame I'm on. 13 minutes, okay. All right, the eschatological hour of judgment and resurrection. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Now, let's look at some correlations between John 5 and Daniel 12, all right? An hour is coming, all right, Urkata in John 5, verse 25, and also in verse 28. Or has come, Eleuthen in 1223 and 1217, in relation to the Son of Man, 527 and 1223 and 34. The combination of the words hour or horror, son, we, us, and glorified, doxa and doxazo, can only be found in John 5, verse 25, 27 through 28, 41, and 44. The word noon, now, or, or now, which is the word now, occurs in clear association to the eschatological hour in John 5, 25, 12, 27, and 31. You see, it's these kind of terms that cause these futurists to say, well, he doesn't mean now in their time, but he means now whenever these things begin to happen, then it's going to be now. No, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says it was now at that time. The hour is coming and now is. And so the word uh, crisis or crisis uh, for judgment is common in both texts. John 5, 22, 24, 27, and 29, and the phrase eternal life, zone I only own in John 5, 24, and, uh, or, or is that zoe, zone, I guess, and 12, 25, and the word honor in John 5, 23, and also 12 and 26. So you can see then that there are correlations between John 5 and John chapter 12. So when we're, when we're studying John 12, we're also studying what? John chapter 5, all right? Now, in John 5, 19 through 30, we have the expectation of an eschatological hour. When the time comes for this hour, we should find the anticipated events fulfilled. It is logical to conclude that the hour of John 5 and John 12 refer, refers consistently to the same thing. This is evident first because of the internal pattern, the hour is coming, the hour has come, and the use of now or noon that implies fulfillment and the common theory, or excuse me, literary features and themes of uh, both contexts share, things that both contexts share. Therefore, now this was his conclusion, you see where I marked it out, because this is his words and so this is what I said. <laughs> Therefore, if the hour in John 5, 25 and 28 alludes to Daniel, then probably also functions the same in John 12, 23 and 27. No, take the probably out. Therefore, if the hour in John 5, 25 and 28 alludes to Daniel, then it also functions the same in what? In John 12, 23 and, uh, and 27. All right, judgment and deliverance. The hour is also contextually linked to the judgment and deliverance. Um, John 12, 31, 12, 32, both of which appear in Daniel 7 and Daniel 12. We have seen the association of judgment and resurrection themes in John 5, 21 through 22, 26 through 27 with the Son of Man, 5, 27, and the hour, 5, 25, 28, and the resurrection. All right, now let's look 
at some consistency in Daniel. Now here's a quote from G.K. Bill uh, from his book, and I can't think of the name of it, but it, it's something about the Old Testament. Uh, what's it? I can't remember. You know, it's the one where he's got page 275 in there. What's the name of it? Theology of the Old Testament. The of the Old Testament. And uh, I didn't bring, bring it with me, so I had to run out on the internet and look for this quote, but I found it. And uh, this is what he said. All right, we should see the consistency in relating the hour as the fulfillment of the book of Daniel. Because remember, the only book in the Old Testament that speaks about the hour that uses that term is the book of Daniel. We should also see the consistency in the use of the hour in the epistles to refer to the same thing. And 1 John 2, 18 and 19 is one of them and also Romans 13, 11, and 12, because in that text, Paul is actually quoting from Daniel chapter 12. I mean, uh, yeah, Daniel 12, went verse uh, 2. This article argues that the last hour in 1 John 2, 18 is best understood against the Old Testament background of Daniel 8 and 12. In particular, the only eschatological use of our or horror in all of the Greek Old Testament occur in the Old Greek of Daniel 8, 17, 19, 11, 35, and uh, 40, and also 12, 1. That one is right on, the, <laughs> right on that track. Uh, <laughs> now, we all know that Jesus and the apostles quoted from the Septuagint, right? So this was the version they were uh, quoting from. There, the hour, or hora, refers to the specific eschatological time when the opponent of God's people will attempt to deceive them. John sees Daniel's prophecy as beginning to be fulfilled in the deceptive work of the Antichrist who have come among the churches to which he is writing. And so, I pulled, this, pulled out one piece just for emphasis. In particular, the only eschatological uses of our or hora in all of the Greek Old Testament occur in the Old Greek of Daniel 8, 17, verse 19, chapter 11 and 35 and 40, and also chapter 12 and verse 1. Now that's pretty powerful. I think that's all that I have. One other thing, uh, because I didn't get a chance to put it in. But in this particular book, um, he develops all of this, but he has a section in here where he actually goes through and he demonstrates the correlations between John chapter 12 and also Daniel and those writings. But, you know, I've already alluded to the passages that are used. And of course, there's much more in the apocryphal and the pseudepigraphal literature that we need to be busy examining and uh, putting before people because a lot of people read that literature, they, uh, they hold it in high esteem, and if we could show them that that belongs to us as far as the event that they were looking at, then I think we'll have a better chance in showing people this hour of glory. And when I come back in the next presentation, I'm going to do that exegesis of John chapter 12 to show you how it is precisely and exactly Matthew 16 verses uh, 24 through 28. Thank you very much for your time.